I've been kind of, I, I didn't really consider it a series, but it's sort of all tying together because uh, several weeks back I, I started talking about knowing God's heart, right? Really seeking after to know God's heart. And I know that topic is very, very close to my heart, very personal to me because I just, I don't want to know God's heart. I always want to know God's heart more. And then the next week I was talking about the secret of seeking, and just seeking God, right? Getting into private time away from everybody else and just seeking God's face, seeking his heart, seeking to know him and, and saying those things, God, I want to know you, right? And just, just going after his presence. And it turns out the people who do that just develop a much deeper, more powerful relationship with God, a more intimate relationship with God. It's just real. It just happens, right? And I want that, boy, you know, and, and I have that and, and I always want more. And then last week was talking about his manifested presence because uh, his his presence is everywhere. That's that theological word, omnipresent, right? However, his manifest presence, when he's felt, when he's with you, when he speaks to you in some way, touches you in some way, that's, right? And, and that's, that's so valuable and so precious to me. I have a huge value for that because uh, uh, much like Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with us, I don't want to do this. Right? Like, I want God's presence. I didn't get into this because I needed a job and, you know, I wanted to teach people theology. I, I had an encounter with God when I was 21 that rocked my world, and I want everybody to have an encounter with God that rocks their world. Right. And I want that encounter week after week after week after week. That's what I want, right? And so I have a huge value on that. Uh, it's the difference between mental Christianity and experienced Christianity. Right? Mental Christianity, you can learn the beliefs and the doctrines, all good, right? But, and be saved, yay. But experiential Christianity is when you experience God's presence on a pretty regular basis, right? And there's communication and there's interaction and God's real to you and he's with you. And that's so precious. And apparently it's controversial in some places. I have no idea why. Yeah, not here. No, we, we want God's presence. We, we love God's presence. So uh, today, though, I want to continue, I guess in that vein still, I want to talk about his glory. And it's from that same chapter, Exodus 33, uh, his called his glory is his goodness. Here's my paraphrase of Exodus 33. Moses said, show me your glory. God answered, my glory is my goodness. Put on your seatbelt. <laughs> right. So let's read it in Exodus 33, and I think you'll agree. I think you'll see what I mean. So uh, starting in the same place, right? that uh, I think this is where we started last week, I believe, too, that uh, God had raised up Moses to uh, lead the people of Israel out of Egypt on um, back to their promised land. And uh, on the way, God, Moses has this conversation with God, and basically Moses is saying, yeah, I, uh, am I alone doing that? I know you, you raised me up, God. I know you sent me, but am I alone, right? Is it me and these, all these people? Because I'm new at this, right? Who's going with me? Uh, so, yeah, Moses said, see, you say to me, bring up this people but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Okay. Now therefore I pray, Moses said, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. And just stop here again because I just, I just have to... Uh, Go after this again. What Moses said, I think, is so precious, so valuable, and that's my heart too, and, and I believe it's yours, or can be yours. God, Moses said, show me your way so that I can know you, right? And what, when he means show me your way, he's like, why do you do the things you do? What, what's your heart like, God, right? What goes on in your heart? What goes on in your mind, right? What are your plans? What are your purposes? What are, right? Who, who are you really, God, and, and how you deal with people, and I want to know your way, and I want to know your heart, and I want to know you. Amen. And God likes that prayer, right? And, the, and the, the kind of religious idea that many people really struggle under is that God's just far away, and he's always slightly angry about something, and you just keep your distance and follow the rules, right? And that's like just that concept is so from the devil. It's just such a big lie. It just totally is. God wants to have personal relationship with us. He really does. It was his idea first. That's why he redeemed us. So you could have his presence with you in your life, right? So he can be with you in this way. And Moses gets it. And Moses said, I want to know you. Can I know you? Can I really know you? And God was like, yes. Yes, that's what this is about, right? Okay, go ahead. And... And God said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. God's answering that yeah, 
question, who's going to go with me? I'm going with you. My presence, my manifest presence will go with you, right? Not just my distant observing presence. My manifest presence will be with you, and I will give you rest because our, our heart finds rest in our maker, right? In its maker. And then God, Moses said again, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. And two things happen here. Moses, first of all, said, I want to know you. I want to know you. But here he says, if your presence doesn't go with us. So it's an us thing too. Moses is praying for, right, the people of Israel that he's leading and he's interceding for the whole nation. And he says, we need your presence with us. Uh, but he's also saying, I want your presence with me, right? And if your presence doesn't go with us, let's not even do this. Go ahead. And for then how will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. This is a review from last week, too, a little bit. But basically the, the idea, again, Moses says, how, if your presence isn't with us, how will we be any different from anybody else? What separates us from the rest of the world, the rest of the peoples, and their religions, and their beliefs, and anything else that goes on? What makes us different? What makes us separate? It's your presence. It's your presence. We don't have, we're not just people that have a nice religion. It's your presence. If your presence isn't with us, we don't want to do this, right? So God, you're going with us, yes? Yeah. Go ahead. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, meaning I will go with you. My presence will go with you. For you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses said, right, <laughs> review of last week, but basically Moses said, as long as I, I've been asking you, can I know you? Can I know your heart? The answer is yes. I've been asking you, will your presence be with us? The answer is yes. He's like, I'm going for more. I'm going for more. Show me your glory. Show me your glory, right? So, uh, you know, the, the word glory there means, can mean several things, and we'll, we'll see it today. You know, one, it could be a secular word, secular kings. They had their thrones and their gold and their armies and their castles or whatever they had. That was their glory, right? And, uh, but that's a secular thing. When you're talking about God, it has a couple of meanings, though. One of the meanings of God's glory, again, is his manifest presence, like really full full manifest presence, right? God would come uh, in the, in the uh, many times historically there recorded in the Bible, God would come like a cloud of glory. His presence would be a visible cloud, a tangible cloud that people could feel and see, cloud of glory. Ooh, that's awesome. He would come as fire, right? There was manifestations of God's presence and glory. Here, basically Moses is asking to see, this God the Father is really what he's after, right? He's asking to see God the Father in his glory. Right? And God's going to answer him. So he says, please show me your glory. But uh, also, his glory is his manifest presence, but it turns out that his glory also is his goodness. And we see that in the, in the answer that God gives. Because Moses said, please show me your glory. And in verse 19, God answers. God said, I will make all my what? Goodness pass before you. And Moses could have said, no, 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 I asked for your glory. And God said, that's it. I'm answering you. I'm going to make my goodness pass before you. My goodness, my glory is my goodness. Put on your seatbelt. <laughs> right? Yeah. God said, I'm going to make my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord, Jehovah, before you. Which is God saying, I'm going to proclaim my own name, right? And <clears throat> biblically, you have to know that what that means. I mean, his name is Jehovah, which means I am, I exist, right? But what, biblically, what that name, your name means your nature, your essence, your character. It's a revelation of who you are. Your name is who you are, right? And biblically, that's what that means. So when God says, I'm going to proclaim my name before you, he says, I'm going to proclaim who I am, my nature, my true self and heart to you, Moses. You're going to know me. My goodness. So Moses says, show me your glory. God says, my goodness will pass before you because my glory is my goodness. And I'll proclaim my name to you because my goodness is my name. <laughs> it's all the same, right? Oh, wow. And God says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. 
and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And that's not really my subject, but it is something I want to unpack just for a moment so that we get it, because God is really saying here, like the human race is a sin-infected race, right? From the time Adam and Eve sinned, sin got inside in human nature, and it passed down from generation. Everybody who's born has the, like that genetic disease of sin, right? And it pops up and, and manifests in everybody. Everybody, my point is everybody needs a savior. We all need a savior, right? Everybody desperately needs a savior. And God's not downplaying that. He's saying, yeah, you, you, this is a lost race. You desperately need a savior. I have it covered, <laughs> right? But God basically is also saying, you're sin infected and I don't owe you anything. I didn't do this to you. This is not my fault. You're sin infected and I don't owe you anything. But because my heart is good and my compassion and my nature and my mercy is who I am, I'm going to choose to have compassion on you, mercy on you. I'm going to choose to offer salvation to you if you say yes, which I want you to say yes. That's my choice. It's not something I owe you. <laughs> yeah, wow. So God says, yeah, make my goodness. My glory is my goodness. My goodness is my name. Verse 20. <laughs> God said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. So God is uh, he's going to manifest himself in a way that Moses understands. He's going to walk by in the form of a man, right? And this is, this is really interesting. This is a big theological point, but I'll share it with you. It matters right now. So uh, God's going to walk by Moses. Isn't God bigger than that? Like, actually, isn't God bigger than that? Is God, like, small and inside of his own creation somehow? No, God's bigger, right? The Bible says that in him we live and move and have our being. God's way bigger than that, right? But yet, he has manifested himself as a form of a man. He does that on the throne. Throughout the Bible, Ezekiel saw him on the, th on the throne. Isaiah saw him on the throne. Apostle John saw him on the throne in Revelation 4. God appears as a man in a man's form on a throne, in a throne room, because he did that, right? He put himself there. He manifested himself in that way. But that's not all of God. God's bigger. Yeah. He made a, a way that, that we could relate to him and see him, and he, he made himself in that form. And then he said, now I'm making you in my image, which is true, right? So he can relate to us. We can relate to him. But he's way bigger than that. But he's going to walk by Moses in the form of a man. But he says, still, it's going to be in full glory, and you can't see my face and live. Because sin-infected man would be toast in the full glory presence of God. You'd just be toast. You'd just fry and dis disappear. Because that sin infection can't stand in that presence, right? In that seeing his face, he said. He's talking about in a physical sense, which is powerful. But God's got a solution for that too, right? <laughs> huh. And, uh, but this is interesting. You can't see my face and live. So, yeah, he's talking about this in a physical sense. But there's also a spiritual sense to this. Because uh, there's... There's a place up in uh, Revelation, the end of the book of Revelation, after the resurrection, after we're glorified, new heavens, new earth, everything's new. And then it says, then we will see his face. After all that, right, all the redemption, everything cleaned up and everything, and we're transformed and finished, it says, then we will see his face. Then we can see his face. Wow. Right? Not yet, right? Mm, amazing. But so then the spiritual sense of this, though, is... God says, if you see my face, you'll die. But yet, we know from a couple of weeks ago, God spoke to King David, and he said, David, seek my face. Why did God call David to do something that God knew was going to kill him? <laughs> and the answer is, because spiritually, what it, what it means is when we're in God's presence, seeking his face and being in his presence, self, selfishness dies in us. Because the human race is infected by selfishness. That's the nature of sin, is self-focus, self-obsession, self-exaltation, self-promotion, self-centeredness. Right? Self, uh, That's the nature of sin. And God says, in my presence, that selfishness shrivels up and dies loses its power. In my presence, seeking my face, you become more conscious of God and less conscious of self. Right? Because self hijacks everything and makes everything about me. Right? And self, people motivated by selfishness hurt each other, betray each other, use each other. 
all that stuff, right? And everybody, yeah, it's just a messed up, broken world because of self, self, self in a sin-infected way. And God said to my presence, that self that hijacks everything, it shrivels up and dies. And you become aware of God's presence and God's love and God's will and God's heart and God's ways. And you walk in that more and more. And so God said, David, seek my face and you'll be a good king for Israel. You won't be a selfish person. You won't be a selfish king. You'll be a good king who knows my heart. And God says that to each one of us. Seek my face. Seek my face. Because in my presence, you're changed. In God's presence, we're changed in a way that nothing else can do. And I know we get born again, right? Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. We're forgiven. We get born again. We have a new spirit inside of us. But how many know, even as Christians, we can still be controlled by self-centeredness and self-focus? even though we're born again and we love Jesus, right? And God says, yeah, you're saved and you're a child of mine now and you're going to heaven and it's all good. However, you're, our soul and our thinking and that, all that realm of us, right? And our flesh still has its, you know, resistance there. And God says there's still something in us that, that resists, right? And uh, he said, I want it to die. I want it to die. Seek my face and you will be transformed, you won't be a selfish person anymore. Oh, whoa, yeah, it's so amazing. That's the only way it happens. Uh, <laughs> but, but something in us, even as Christians, uh, in my experience, there's something in us in that soul realm of ourselves and our flesh that when it's, you know, when the idea of going into worship, going into God's presence, seeking God, something in us resists. And I'm not talking about like we have demons or something. I mean, that's a different issue. I'm talking about something in our own soul resists. Because our soul is still like self-focused and like I have a to-do list and I'm checking off my to-do list and I'm in control and I've got, you know what I'm saying? I got things to do and I'm making my choices and I got my plans and I got my agenda and God says, seek my face, let it die. <laughs> right? <laughs> let it die. Yeah. So that you, right? Because when we, when we die is when we really live. Death for Jesus was followed by resurrection, life, victory, and dominion and power and glory, right? When we die to that selfishness is when we actually begin to live the life of Christ in his victory, in his presence, in his faith, in his love, right? And so God says, seek my face. Come on, right? Mm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so keep, let's keep reading. 21, the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by. And what's his glory? His goodness, right? My glory, well, I got, let me just comment on that for a minute. So basically, Moses said, said show me your glory. God says, my, my goodness will pass by you, right? And that, that, that raised up a question for me. Like, God, the fact that you're just going to walk by me, how does that display your goodness to me? When somebody walks, just walks by me, that doesn't suddenly convince me that they're all good, does it? Right? God said, I'll walk by you, and you'll know. I'll just walk by you, and in my presence, you will have an immediate awareness of my goodness. <laughs> in my glory, manifested presence, you will have an immediate, powerful awareness of my goodness. Because you asked to know my heart. You asked to know me. I'm good. It's who I am. You asked to see my glory. I'm good. And God said, my goodness. Because, right? Yeah, yeah. That's it. You're going to have an immediate awareness. Uh, do you have anybody else experience that? Like when you're in God's really manifested presence, like you have a very heightened awareness of his goodness. Anybody else? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And if you haven't experienced that, man, I so want that for you. I so want that for you. And you can. You absolutely can experience that. So I'm going to put you, he said, I'm going to put you on a rock, and I'm going to put you in the cleft of a rock, which other preachers uh, have long uh, basically uh, pointed out that this is kind of, the rock is kind of a prophetic symbol of Jesus himself, of Christ, right? Because stand on the rock, right? That's Christ. So actually, God says, I'm going to put you on the rock and in the rock, 
we're on Christ and we're in Christ, and God says, I'll pass by and you won't die, right? <laughs> I'm protecting you from, Christ is our shield, so to speak, from the full glory, and Christ is our salvation so that we can have a relationship with God, but eventually in the end of Revelation, it says we will see his face. <laughs> right? Okay, so verse 23 then. God says, then I will, as I pass by, I'll take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen yet. <laughs> oh, wow. So the whole, the whole point of me, of why I'm reading that, though, is I just absolutely want you to see when Moses said, show me your glory, God said, oh, you're going to see my goodness. That's what that is. That's what that is. And you're going to know my name. You're going to know who I am. <sighs> Right? And, and the answer is yes, by the way. The answer is yes. Right? I'm going to protect you, but I'm going to do this. And so uh, God is saying that in, in his glory presence, there is an immediate revelation and awareness of his goodness. That's his true nature, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, yeah. So look at um, 2 Chronicles 5, 1 through 5, what I want, want you to know is the same thing happened. God's glory presence came when King Solomon built the temple, right, and, and dedicated that temple to God, and God's presence came and filled the temple. And there was an immediate awareness of God's goodness when that happened. So here's, here's the story. Uh, King David had wanted to build the temple for God, uh, but... Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't his to do. God said, no, your son Solomon's going to do that. So King Solomon was next. Solomon built this beautiful temple for God. Uh, it was based on the tabernacle of Moses, right? God had told Moses how to build that thing. And Solomon built it, but it's way more glorious and beautiful and, you know, in every way. So all the work that Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished. Solomon brought in the things which his father David had dedicated the silver and the gold and all the furnishings, and he put them in the treasuries of the house of God. So Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel in Jerusalem, that they might bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord up from the city of David, which is Zion. So that Ark of the Covenant has to go inside the temple, right? The Ark of the Covenant was... The thing that God told Moses to make, God said, that's where my presence will be. The Ark of the Covenant goes inside the temple, and my presence will be on that Ark, right? And we know, again, God's way bigger than that. He's not limited to that one place, but he put his manifested presence on the Ark of the Covenant inside the temple. Very, very cool. And the temple had three parts, right? It had an outer court, where, uh, and then there was a... a kind of the, the building part of it in the first part of it was called the holy place but then inside was called the holy of holies it was three parts right outer court holy place holy of holies and that inner part the third part was where the ark of the covenant goes inside right god's presence was inside that and that's very significant by the way so solomon's going to get the ark of the covenant and bring it into the temple it's time the temple's ready go ahead Therefore, all the men of Israel assembled with the king at the feast, which was in the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites, the priests, they took up the ark. And they brought up the ark, the, tab uh, they, they brought up the ark, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. The priests and the Levites brought them up. Go to verse 7. And then the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. Because that ark had like, a, you know, angel wings over it, angels, right, and their wings covering that place. And, uh, and that's a picture of the throne room, by the way. So they bring the ark of the covenant into the holy of holies. And then verse 11, and it came to pass that when the priests came out of the most holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Haman and Jeduthun with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Wow, this is a celebration, isn't it? You're right. So they're, the, the temple's ready. After lots of work, they're bringing in the Ark of the Covenant, and now they're all going to start praising and worshiping God and right, playing music and shouting. Go ahead. 
And indeed it came to pass, when the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and they praised the Lord, saying, For he is good. For his mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud. And this is not a rain cloud, <laughs> random. This is the cloud of God's presence, the glory cloud of his presence that is visible and tangible, fills the temple, right? Ah, the glory. And then what happens? So that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house. This is also um, mentioned in, in the book of Kings, and it says that the priests were just falling to the ground. They couldn't even stand. The glory cloud came in. The presence of God came upon them, and they're just dropping like flies. Right? That even happens today sometimes. We pray for people, and people fall under that. You know, and that's just, that's just a light touch. This was, this was the glory cloud, and everybody's just... Wow. But why did it start? They dedicated the temple, brought in the ark, God's presence, and began to proclaim his goodness, for he is good, and his mercy is forever. And God's presence came, like glory. Huh, that's interesting, isn't it? Okay, go ahead. And then um, it, chapter 6 continues and basically says then Solomon, King Solomon, he has a lot of people of Israel assembled together and he starts dedicating the temple. Solomon prays and he says, oh God, we dedicate this temple to you. God, this is your place. This is your temple, right? For, place for your presence, for your purpose. God, we dedicate this place to you. And then uh, he finishes that prayer and verse, uh, oh, chapter 7 Verse 1 through 3 says, when Solomon had finished praying, what happens? Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple again and more. Whew, this is pretty fun. This is pretty interesting. Solomon finishes the dedication prayer. Normally, of course, they're doing sacrifices right at that temple. That's what they did. And normally, they would build their own fire for the sacrifices to go on, right? But God says, you don't have to build your own fire. I got this. <laughs> fire falls and consumes the offerings and the sacrifices. Just boom. And, <laughs> and the glory cloud came again and more. <sighs> now look at this. Verse 2 and 3. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. They couldn't even walk into it. They couldn't even step into the glory. It was so powerful. <sighs> or they'd fall down or bounce back. <sighs> and then verse 3. Ready? We read all that to read verse 3. When the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple. They bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good and his mercy is forever. Wow. <laughs> yeah. As soon as God's glory presence comes, they have, guess what happened to Moses? The same thing. An immediate awareness of God's goodness. An immediate revelation an awareness of his amazing goodness, and all they can do is proclaim his goodness. <laughs> wow, that's why God said to Moses, when Moses said, show me your glory, God said, my goodness will pass by you. <laughs> and you'll know, you'll know. <laughs> and his presence comes here, and they knew. You are good. You are good. You are good. They just cry it out. So several things here that we have to understand. One is uh, God doesn't, God's long-term plan wasn't to live in buildings, right? Like God's way bigger than that. He didn't want to live in buildings. This is a temple. This is a temporary thing. This is a symbol. This temple, real as it was, was a symbol of what? What's, what's God's temple now? We are. Right? The Bible, the New Testament says, right, after Jesus came, right, and died for us, rose, the Holy Spirit came, live inside of us. The, the New Testament says, now you are God's temple. It says that several times. You are the temple of God. You are the temple of his spirit. You're the temple of his presence. That temple of, of Solomon was only a symbol of us. 
And because the temple had three sections, the outer court, then that inner, you know, that holy place, and then that holy of holies where the ark of God's presence went inside. And that's a picture of you because the outer court is your body and the holy place is your soul, your mind, and the holy of holies is your spirit. And the ark of God's presence, the manifested presence of God goes in your spirit, in your heart, and you are the temple. And the temple was a place specifically, Solomon's temple was a place specifically designed and built for God's presence. And when God's presence arrived in the temple, the purpose of that temple was fulfilled, a place designed and built to carry God's presence. And you are designed and built by God to carry his presence, to be his temple. Not just little presence, glory presence. <laughs> glory presence. When did, the, the, yeah, the moment of his, his presence arriving there was the moment that, that yeah, that, that, that the reason that temple exists. And then when did this happen? When they invited God's presence in, and they dedicated that temple to God's use. Solomon prayed all of chapter 6, God, this is your temple. God, this is your place. God, let your presence come. God, let your presence be in this place. This is your temple. This is for you, for your purposes. Right? And Solomon dedicated all. What does that have to do with us? When you dedicate yourself as God's temple, God says, <laughs> my glory live inside of you. And in his glory is an immediate revelation of his goodness. His glory is his goodness. And his goodness is his name. Oh. Mm. <laughs> and the, the last thing that I thought was interesting in this from chapter 5 to chapter 7 here, the first time it says... When they brought the ark in, it said that they began to proclaim God's goodness, and then his presence came. But in chapter 7, it says his presence came again after the dedication, and then they began to proclaim his goodness again. And you see that. It works both ways. Proclaim his goodness, his presence comes. His presence comes, you proclaim his goodness. <laughs> Cycle, and <laughs> right? Cycle and repeat. Cycle and repeat. Proclaim his goodness. Dedicate yourself to him. Yeah. And watch his goodness just manifest in your life. That's the whole point. It's not just that he's good. It's that his goodness will manifest in you and in your life. That's the whole point. He's not standing back saying, I'm good and you're not. Right? I mean, we do need a Savior. Oh, Lord, we, do, we need a Savior. But we have one. We have one. And he says, I'll live in you, and my goodness will manifest in you, and it will become part of you. Right? Ah. And God will be glorified through you and through me. All right. Go to uh, um, Hebrews 2.10. There's uh, several of the th thoughts I just want to add into this right now. So there's, I want to read two verses that basically say we are destined for glory, right? God, in his calling for us, he destined us for glory. And it says there's a dozen verses like that. I'll just read two of them. So Hebrews 2.10 said it was fitting for him, God the Father, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. In bringing many sons to glory. Who are those sons? That's us, right? That's us. In, and what's, what's God doing? Bringing many sons to glory. That's us. That's us. Uh, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. That's Jesus, right? Captain of our salvation who suffered for us and died for us on the cross. And, and so God is bringing you to glory. That's his plan and his purpose. That's why Jesus came. Also, uh, John, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 8, 16 to 18. says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This is true for you if you're born again. If you've accepted Jesus and you're born again, the Holy Spirit now lives inside of you, and he bears witness with your spirit. You are a child of God, right? Go ahead. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, because we also suffer in this world, don't we, right? That we may also be what? Glorified together. The Bible says that's God's plan. He's going to glorify you together with Christ, right? Bringing many sons to glory, bringing you into his glory, being glorified together. And verse 18 repeats it and says, I consider 
that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. <laughs> oh, that was always God's plan. That was his idea, right? That was not our idea. That was his idea. He says, that's why I came for you. But interesting. So um, that's, that's kind of a, um, I mean, if, if people have any religious thinking, that whole idea is like, what? Whoa, I don't know, right? So uh, there's a verse that is commonly misunderstood uh, about God's glory in us. And uh, it's uh, Isaiah 42, 8. I'd like to read that. Commonly misunderstood. God said, I am the Lord. That is my name. Jehovah, I am. Okay? That is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Right? Well, I'm not giving my praise. Carved images as idols, so idols don't get any of this. right? But God says, my glory I will not give to another. And, uh, you know, we've, we've probably all heard, you know, teaching, don't touch God's glory, you know, God's you know, glorify God and, you know, God's glory is his own and, you know, it's not for us in any way. Uh, and it can go into a really weird error, error, place of error. So God says, I will not give my glory to another. And I asked God about this one time, many years ago, actually. I asked God, what about that? And he answered me. And he said, yes, I will not give my glory to another. But you are not another. <laughs> You are part of me now. Joined to Jesus as the body of Christ. In God, you are born again sons and daughters. You're part of me. You're joined to me. My spirit is in you. You are not another. You are called into my glory. I will fill you with my glory. You will live in my glory forever. And my glory is my goodness. <laughs> Second Corinthians 3.18, Apostle Paul said this, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the, what? The glory of the Lord, right? The glory of, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And he's saying every time that you worship Jesus, wait on Jesus, read his word, right? Spend time with the Lord in prayer, whatever it is. When you're looking spiritually into the face of Jesus, is something in us dying? Yes, selfishness is dying, but something else is happening. As you're looking into the face of Jesus, into his glory, and his glory is his goodness, you are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. He's working, he's working glory in you and bringing you to higher glory, higher glory, higher glory. Every time you spend time with Jesus, you're changed. But his glory is his goodness. And he's bringing you from goodness to goodness. That he'll be glorified through you. Amen? Amen. Wow. And you're looking more and more like him. But it's goodness. Wow. It's manifested goodness in your life and through your life. Revealing God. Wow. Wow. You can almost think right now. I know I, know, I can see, see people's wheels turning. How selfish am I, or how much is goodness manifested in my life right now? <laughs> the question is not a condemnation question. The question might, might be an awakening question, though, right? If I'm, like, self-consumed a lot, how about spending time with Jesus, and that loses its power? And how about I get transformed into more and more glory, more and more goodness? Amen? Amen? Yeah. That's why God says, come on, seek my face, right? That's why God says, yeah. Um, there's um, several Bible principles that I, I want to share really quickly uh, of this because it says glory to glory, which means more glory, right? It doesn't mean less glory. You're going, yeah, you're going more, more glory every time. Every time you spend time with Jesus, more glory, more goodness, you're transformed. Uh, and that's why spending time with him is a really, really, really big deal. But Romans 1.17 uh, says, in the gospel, the righteousness of God, of God is revealed from faith to faith. There's a place where it says we go from faith to faith, right? One level of faith to more level of faith. Uh, and the, also, I'm not going to read this one, but it's in John chapter 2 where Jesus, uh, they, you know, he went to the wedding at Cana and mom said, mom, Mary came and said, hey, they're out of wine. Take care of it, right? <laughs> and uh, he ended up doing it. He changed water into wine. And then when they tasted the wine, they said, wow, usually people serve the good wine at the beginning. And then when everybody's trashed, then they, you know, bring out the cheap stuff. And, but they said, 
you've saved the best wine for last, right? You see a principle going here, glory to glory, faith to faith, the best wine for last. And then what else? Um, uh, Haggai 2.9, God was talking uh, to Israel uh, about the, their, their temple. The temple of Solomon ended up getting destroyed. Long story. They're rebuilding the temple, but it just doesn't look the same, right? And then God makes this great promise. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord. But, but he, it turns out he was actually talking about not the, not the physical temple. He was actually talking about we are the temple, we are the temple, right? The new covenant temple is us. And he said, yeah, the, the future temple will be greater in glory than the temple of Solomon ever was. You are that temple. You are that temple. But you see it again. God goes glory to glory, greater to greater, uh -huh. faith to faith. It's best wine for last. Proverbs 4.18. God says, the path of the just or the righteous, that's you, by the way, is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. <laughs> the moment you say yes to Jesus, light enters and is birthed in your heart. And God says, just keep walking with me, and the light gets brighter, 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 until you're walking in fullness of light and truth and understanding. Because that's God's way. Always more, always better, right? And um, Hebrews 8, 6 also says, even God's covenants get better. Uh, Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is, Jesus is also the mediator of a better covenant established on better promises. So God says, my covenants get better, my promises get better, glory to glory, faith, you get it, don't you? The best wine for last, it's glory of the latter temple better. God always goes glory to glory better and better. And that's 2 Corinthians 3.18, if you put that up again, please. And that's, how does that happen? He said, beholding in a, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord being transformed. It's spend time with Jesus. Look into his goodness. Look into his glory and his presence. And you are being transformed from glory to glory. But that means goodness to goodness also. Right? Because that's God's way. But we also know that we're still living in this world. And this world is still kind of really enemy territory in some ways, isn't it? I mean, Jesus has the victory. The devil's defeated. We get it. We get it. But the devil's still running around doing his thing for a while, and if you're living for Jesus, you might have experienced that there's opposition, <laughs> right? Some stuff comes against you, right? And so this is God saying, here's, here's the beautiful revelation. I'm always increasing the glory in you. I'm always working in you, increasing the light, increasing faith, increasing, right? Anointing, increasing presence, increasing victory, increasing everything in you, but you need to persevere because there is opposition in this world. And if you get knocked down easily and you stay knocked down, it, the thing kind of comes to sort of a halt here, right? It doesn't mean God's given up on you. It just means you're stuck. Don't get knocked down and stay knocked down. God said, persevere. Persevere. Keep going with me. Keep walking with me. Because as long as you walk with me, it goes glory to glory. Right? Always better. Always better. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Persevere. All right. So... I'm going to stop there. What I want to uh, do is just for the next five minutes, same thing as last week. Uh, I just want to have a few minutes here where really we're just going to ask God again for his presence, his manifest presence. And yeah, Tom, you can, you can help too there. And I want, we want to ask God for his glory. And just what I want for you today in the next five minutes, just, you know, kind of close your eyes maybe. And, and uh, I'm going to lead some prayers and, uh, I'm going to walk around, Tom, walk around, yeah, Chris, and uh, I know we've got a lot more people that could do that, but this is good. We'll just have three of us, and we'll just, we'll kind of walk around, and we'll, what I want to do, though, is just lead you in a time where you invite God's presence more into your life. That's my whole goal. I want you to invite God's presence and, and let his presence just come upon you more, his glory presence come upon you, fill you, embrace you, walk in his presence. Because Moses said, God, I want to know you. God, I want your presence with me. God, show me your glory. And God said, yes, yes, and yes. And you are that temple dedicated to God's presence. 
you are that temple designed and built for his presence and dedicated to his presence. And just pray with me. Just say yes. Yes, God. Yes. Yes. I'm your temple designed and built for your presence. Fill me. Fill me. Jesus, live in my heart. God, live in my heart. Live in my soul. Holy Spirit, live in me. Fill me. God, fill me with your presence. Increase. Increase. Your presence. With me. In me. Upon me. Flowing through me. Hmm. Oh, God, increase your goodness in my life. Your glory is your goodness. Hallelujah. 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 His presence breaks you free from religion. It's a powerful thing. Religion is not... The Spirit of God. Religion makes us kind of angry and kind of bitter and kind of self-righteous and kind of all kinds of things, unpleasant things. But God breaks us free from religion, and God fills you with his presence, his goodness, his glory, because you have Jesus as your Savior, because you have Jesus in your life. God fills you with his goodness. His presence increases on you, his glory. Yes, God, fill us more. Maybe you just lift your hands and close your eyes and lift your hands and say, God, fill me. Fill me more. Fill me more. Holy Spirit, come upon me. Fill me. Mm -hmm. Fill this temple. Fill this temple. Mm -hmm. Yes, increase your glory in my life. Increase your goodness in my life, God. Mm -hmm. His presence sets you free from bondages, sets you free from captivity, and oppression, lies, change. His pres chains, his presence comes. His presence fills you with his goodness, his love, his truth, his power, his freedom, his healing, his presence comes upon you now. <sighs> Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us, fill us, fill us. <laughs> Can I pray? Presence. Presence, 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 presence. Come, Holy Spirit, increase. Presence, presence, presence. Fill us, fill us. Shaka, she Holy Spirit, presence, presence, fill us, fill us, presence, glory, glory to glory, glory to glory, glory to glory, goodness to goodness, ha, temples for your presence, God, dedicated to your presence, God. Fill us, fill us. Shagalasi shalama. More, more, more. Presence. 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 Glory, glory, glory. Shala. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Presence, 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 presence. Come, Holy Spirit, presence. Thank you, Lord. Shisali ki alamasa.
Thank you, Lord. Breathe on us. Just another, another few moments. Jesus, touch us. Still touch us. Because you're doing a powerful work in us. It's not a drive-through. God, it's your presence saturating us, soaking us. It's your presence. It's your presence coming in. It's your glory. It's your goodness. So we dedicate ourselves to your presence, God. Doesn't mean we're perfect yet. Doesn't mean we're going to be perfect yet today or tomorrow. But God, your presence transforms us. Your presence changes us. Your presence fills us. <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit. Like the wind, like the wind of Pentecost. Jesus, breathe on us again. Jesus, breathe on us again. Breathe on us again. Shasta. Come, God. Thank you, Lord. treasure. What a treasure. Presence. Holy presence. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. 